Okay, we are live. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? PC recording is underway. Back up is rolling. Cloud is up. Sergeant Leonardo, you may begin with opening. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, joint with the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. At this time, will all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones and electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony you wish to submit for the record, you may do so by sending it via email to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for staying with us, and I apologize for starting late. Good morning, and welcome to today's very important oversight hearing on mental health impact of COVID-19 on women as caregivers. I am council member Dominic Vanessa D. I have pronouns are she, her, hers. I am the chair for the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Equity. We are also joined by the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction Chair, Council Member Farrah Lewis. The COVID pandemic and its economic fallout has had a global impact on certain populations more than others. Since the coronavirus outbreak was cleared national emergency a year and a half ago today, women and women of color in particular have suffered greater job loss when compared to men. This is because, A, we are more likely to be employed in jobs that require in-person work. We work in low wage jobs. Caregiving responsibilities falls more on us than others. Additionally, racism, sexism, and other forms of bias that existed before the pandemic are which are made difficult for many women of color to secure solid employment, left with more vulnerable to others during the pandemic. Yet studies have shown that women of color are critical to the economic stability of families and the majority. 67.5% of black mothers are the primary caregivers, sole barriers, rather breadwinners for the families compared to 30% of white mothers. Moreover, recent federal data shows that while many women of color work in essential jobs, they also largely work in several of the industries hardest hit by the losses of during this pandemic. This includes the accommodations and food industry. Nearly 54% are women and the health and social assistance industry 80%, alarming. According to the data from the health survey conducted in the late 2020, women are younger, black or Hispanic, uninsured, low income, and have less than, a, less than a bachelor's degree, where they're most likely to lose their jobs related to COVID-related reasons. 30% of women quit their jobs because their children are in school and lack of and daycare has closed down. 23% quit because they live with someone at elevated risk of COVID. When schools closed for in-person instruction last year, mothers took many new responsibilities including more childcare and assisting with remote learning. Now the Delta virus, which has driven pediatric cases to record highs, once again threatens the closure of school buildings. With all this, what all this data tells us is that most vulnerable before the pandemic has only become more vulnerable during the pandemic. Having been a frontline worker as a director of a small family shelter before I joined the council, I knew firsthand about mental anguish and that many of my women clients suffered during the pandemic, and men as well. While we all felt the impact of the pandemic, my clients were in crisis. I had single mothers, some with language barriers, who had to teach themselves new things they never learned in order to assist their children, remote learning, ideals. Fortunately, the shelter contracted with two nonprofits that provided responsive mental health services and more families than ever before took advantage of that resource during the pandemic. They were flexible and understanding, and while clients were satisfied with the services, there were some barriers to access. This including having the right technology to connect those services and lacking privacy while in shelter. One of my clients told me that she had to take her counseling class, her counseling calls in the bathroom so her son can study. A sad moment indeed. So I'm very pleased that we are having the hearing. I have lots of questions 
about women men, and mental needs in New York City and I would like to know if, we, if the needs were actually met. Thank you. I am now gonna turn it over to Chair Lewis. Thank you, Chair Diaz, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Councilmember Farrah Lewis, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction, and I'd like to thank everyone joining us today for this joint hearing with the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Our hearing is about mental health impact of COVID-19 on women as caregivers, and we now know that when it comes to mental health, women who were already more vulnerable to conditions like depression and anxiety have been disproportionately and negatively impacted by the effects of this pandemic. Overall, one in two Americans or 51% of the public has reported their mental health has deteriorated because of this pandemic. Yet 57% of women have reported increased incidents of anxiety and depression as opposed to 44% of their male counterparts. A 2021 University of Chicago Medicine study discovered that early on in the pandemic, women experienced increased incidents of health-related socioeconomic risks such as food and housing insecurity and interpersonal violence. Women also experienced what the report called alarming high rates of mental health problems including depression and anxiety. By the end of the report, researchers found it to be both incredible and concerning that nearly half of the women surveyed, including more than a quarter of those who reported no health-related socioeconomic risks, had experienced incidents of violence or worsening economic, socioeconomic conditions. Significantly, 29% of the women surveyed reported symptoms of depression and anxiety nearly twice the pre-pandemic rate and one in six women screened positive for post-traumatic stress disorder. A similar Kaiser Family Foundations found that about one third of those who reported a negative impact on their mental health say there was a time in the past year where they thought they might need mental health services or mediation, but they didn't get it. Nearly half of women who report a negative mental health impact due to the pandemic say they did not get mental health care that they needed. In addition, about one in five adults under the age of 50, Black adults and women say they have experienced worsened mental health due to the pandemic and have not gotten mental health services or medication they thought they might need. Lack of access to providers and affordability appear to be among the biggest barriers for those who sought after mental health care due to COVID-19 pandemic stressors. Finally, according to a research scientist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, the pandemic's disproportionate economic toll, which has punished women more than men, has contributed to the mental health gender gap. Women are more likely to have lost work in the COVID-19 recession and childcare, elder care and navigating remote schooling are hitting women harder than men, which is a perfect storm for women's mental health. Additionally, Black and Latina women show higher rates of COVID-19 related mental health problems than white women. At today's hearing, the committees will be hearing from the administration, providers, community-based organizations, and advocates about how New York City can provide a more effective response and mental health supports to women impacted by COVID-19. I wanna thank the administration, the executive director of the Commission on Gender Equity, and the executive deputy commissioner of mental, health, mental hygiene at DOHMH for being here with us today. I know you are committed to working on this issue for all New Yorkers and to effectively address the mental health needs that, raise, that are raised in our communities. And we look forward to hearing from all of you. I also wanna thank my colleagues, as well as my staff, uh, Legislative Director Christia Winter, and my other uh, staffers in the council, as well as council committee staff, senior counsel, Sarah Liss, Legislative Policy Analyst, Christy Dreyer, and Financial Analyst, Lauren Hunt for making today's hearing possible. I now turn to our moderator who will review hearing proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, 
As we transition, I want to um, acknowledge my colleagues, Riley, Gennaro, Kalos, Genowitz, and P. Samuels, Ayala, and Rosenthal. Thank you. Turn it over to the moderator. Thank you, Chairs Dharma, uh, Diaz, and Lewis. Uh, I am Chloe Rivera, the Senior Policy Analyst of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I will go over a few procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. You will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. For everyone testi testifying today, please note that there may be a few second delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members will have, would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Uh, first, we have Jacqueline Ebanks, the Executive Director of the Commission on Gender Equity, and Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, the Executive Deputy Commissioner for Mental Health and Hygiene at the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. I will first read the oath, and after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration to individually respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to CM to council member questions? Uh, Executive Director Ebanks? I do. And Dr. Cunningham? I do. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director Ebanks, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Diaz, Chair Lewis, and members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I want to also acknowledge the leadership of Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Ayala on the Commission on Gender Equity. We thank you so much for your partnership, and we're happy to have you serve as commissioners. I am Jacqueline Ebanks, Executive Director of New York City's Commission on Gender Equity. In this role, I also serve as an advisor to the Mayor and First Lady on policies and issues affecting gender equity in New York City for all girls, women, transgender, and gender non-binary New Yorkers, regardless of their ability, age, ethnicity, or race, regardless of their faith, gender expression, immigrant status, sexual orientation, and or socioeconomic status. My colleague, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, who is the executive director, executive deputy commissioner for mental hygiene at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I welcome this opportunity to discuss the administration's efforts around the mental health impact of COVID-19 on women as caregivers. The de Blasio is administration is steadfast in its commitment to promote equity, excellence, and fairness for all New Yorkers, and has converted its words into action to become a leader in protecting the rights of all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or background. It is within this context that CGE works to tear down equity barriers across New York City. CGE carries out its activities across three areas of focus within a human rights framework and using an intersectional lens. These areas of focus, as you know, are one, economic mobility and opportunity, two, health and reproductive justice, and three, safety. To the matter of at hand today, I want to take us back to March 2020, when COVID-19 virus was spreading aggressively within New York City. As city agencies developed and implemented emergency and longer term responses to the pandemic, the Commission on Gender Equity focused on how best to inform and shape a gender equitable recovery, resulted in the release of our Gender Equity and COVID-19 Recovery Survey. 
This longitudinal survey was designed to better understand the COVID-19 recovery needs and experiences of New Yorkers and included both qualitative and quantitative questions that addressed our three areas of focus. While we continue to prepare a full analysis of the data, I would like to share some insights that we have gained from the first survey distributed in, on June 10th, 2020. We had over 1,300 responses from a non-random sample. 64% who submitted um, responses were female identified. 34% of the uh, were submitted by male identified persons and 2% by transgender and gender non-binary New Yorkers. Financial hardships stemming from unemployment or fear of job loss were prominent in survey responses. 16% of respondents indicated that they were unemployed, 51% of whom attributed that job loss to the pandemic. Responses showed a tension between the desire to find work and feeling unsafe in the workplace, forcing participants to make an uncomfortable choice between a loss of income and the risk of illness. Wealthier respondents generally were able to avoid this choice as they were more likely to be able to work from home and in some cases, temporarily leave the city. The relevant themes that we identified at that time in, in June, mid 2020 were included stress around the inability to pay rent with fears of eviction, and two, concern that individuals will not be able to pay their bill once the extra $600 unemployment benefits run out. And so if you'll recall, this was um, the provisions that we had at the beginning of the pandemic. Regarding caregiving, from our non-random sample, 25% of our responses um, came from individuals who indicated that there were caregivers. These respondents indicated that between March and June 2020, the child care services that parents and caregivers previously relied on were suddenly either unavailable, unavailable or perceived as unsafe in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. This created additional stress, especially for those with limited social support and or an ability, inability to work from home. Participants described many challenges with childcare, ranging from feeling that remote education was a second job to feeling pressured to choose between continuing to work or care for their children in the home. In those early days of the pandemic, many respondents expressed fear around returning to the office because of concern about contracting the virus and bringing it into the home or leaving their children alone for remote education. I have a rather lengthy quote from one respondent, but I think it really runs the gamut and is an ideal example of what um, several of our respondents experienced. So if you'll permit me to quote, and I quote here, my spouse had not lost his job during the pandemic, but I was supposed to return from maternity leave. So while our household has been generally stable, I was not equipped or prepared to provide full-time childcare and exacerbating this is that our old daycare is essentially providing us with minimal assistance and still charging us money. Not only that, no one has assured us or given us the impression that any expert knows how children fit into the pandemic puzzle. And the result is that the government seems to be greenlighting our childcare provider into stealing our money while giving us no reason to trust them to reopen safely. Additionally, I was on maternity to leave at the start of the pandemic, and now my job can't take me back, but there is no other job out there for me at the moment. I would have to interview and find a job while I have two children to manage on my own, and the result is that I'm not going to be able to look for a job and may get pushed out of my industry entirely. My male counterpart also is able to walk away at any moment from work and now my only job is maintaining house and children like I belong in the 1950s and signed up for this." End of quote. In the health and reproductive justice segment of our survey, 
many participants indicated that their overall health was good or better. However, ma the majority of respondents indicated they were struggling with significant mental health burdens in the first four months of the pandemic. 92% of respondents indicated feeling anxious and 84% of respondents reported feeling depressed every day or nearly every day since the pandemic. With transgender and gender non-binary people and women reporting comparatively higher rates than their male counterparts. Respondents gave myriad reasons for experiencing anxiety and depression. The most prevalent themes were loneliness and isolation. For also, for those who contracted COVID-19, many described not only the physical burden of the illness itself, but also expressed fear and anxiety around lingering symptoms, spreading the virus to someone else in the household, and lack of access to testing to confirm the infection. Additionally, many respondents who cared for either elderly family or immunocompromised members of their household experienced greater anxiety as the risk burden for going out to public to get groceries or other necessities left them wondering if they would bring the virus home. Lastly, many respondents lost a family member or loved one to COVID-19 illness. Compounding the grief for the death itself, participants shared also the pain and sorrow for the inability to say goodbye to the person or in person. So finally, in the safety segment of the survey, New Yorkers being deeply fearful about their safety were deeply fearful about their safety as COVID-19 virus rapidly spread throughout New York during the early months. 7% of the respondents reported feeling unsafe at home, 53% reported feeling unsafe at work, and most predominantly, 70% reported feeling unsafe in public. Many respondents indicated, I'm sorry, I'm in the office and haven't moved for a while, so I'll turn the light back on. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, many respondents indicated that they felt much better working from home and hope teleworking options will continue in the future. So here I go to recommendations. Through their qualitative and quantitative responses, survey respondents have shown us how COVID-19 affected and exacerbated hardships across all aspects of their lives lives which were too often already impacted by histories of systemic oppressions and exploitation. As we consider their responses, we gain insight into shaping an equitable COVID-19 recovery and post-COVID reality. We must advance new policies and programs that ensure that all women, transgender and gender non-binary individuals can live safe, healthy and economically secure lives. And to this end, CGE made the following recommendation in our 2020 annual report, which we called Advancing Gender Equity During Crisis. To address our focus area of economic mobility and opportunity, we recommend that is essential as uh, local, federal, and national and state governments, we institute universal health care and universal child care. It is also essential, we recommend that we raise the minimum wage and expand workers' bargaining rights. And needless to say, it becomes imperative that we eliminate the gender and racial pay gaps. To address issues pertaining to health and recommend, um, reproductive justice, we recommend expanding mental health services. And also with all health services, we absolutely need to prioritize marginalized communities and those most vulnerable, including the aging. Finally, to address issues concerning safety, we are in support of restorative programs and the recommendations made in the Center for Court Innovations report using restorative approach, approaches to address intimate partner violence. These programs should begin with a pilot and must have the following qualities. They should be predicated on an individual survivor's voluntary desire to engage in a restorative process. They should be based in communities rather than referred to legal entities. 
They should address structural oppression and incorporate community and cultural specific components. And they should have a dedicated funding structure that includes a mix of public and private funds. Thank you so much for this opportunity to address this critical issue. I look forward to addressing any questions you may have. At this time, my colleague, Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, will make test, will provide testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Executive Deputy Doctor, Executive Deputy Commissioner Dr. Cunningham, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, good morning, Chair Lewis, Chair Diaz, and members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. I am Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of the Health Commissioner, Dr. Dave Chakshi, thank you for the opportunity to testify today alongside Executive Director Ebanks from the Commission on Gender Equity about the mental health impact of COVID-19 on women as caregivers. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented loss of life, financial distress, and social isolation to the lives of New Yorkers. And we know that the burden has not been felt equally. Prior to the pandemic, Health Department survey data from January of 2020 showed that there was no significant difference in the prevalence of having probable anxiety or depression among adults with children under the age of 18 in the household compared to adults without children in the household. In comparison, during the pandemic, Health Department survey data from April and May of 2020 found that healthcare workers and adults with children in the household we're more likely to report experiencing adverse mental health. As New York City continues to respond to and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, the health department is committed to sharing reliable information and resources, collaborating with behavioral health partners across the city and strengthening existing resources to support the mental health and well-being of all New Yorkers. Let me share a few highlights of the work that the health department is doing to help New Yorkers during this time with a focus on those who have been disparately impacted. Throughout the pandemic, the health department has promoted the use of NYC Well, the city's 24 seven talk, text and chat service for mental health and substance use support, counseling and referrals to additional services. In addition to connection to counseling, NYC Well offers a wealth of resources in their online database of behavioral and substance use services, many of which are tailored to healthcare workers caregivers, those who are pregnant, and new parents. Additionally, we've also promoted use of New York's Project HOPE Emotional Support Line, which provides crisis counseling, connection to local providers, and social services, including medical, housing, food, and financial assistance. All New Yorkers, including women who are caregivers, can contact either of these resources to speak with a counselor if they're feeling stressed or overwhelmed, and can receive referral to an experienced local provider or connect with other behavioral health, substance use and social services, social resources if needed. We've also focused on sharing information about these services in the communities that need it most. The health department has also supported the mental health and resiliency of communities most impacted by COVID-19 through the COVID-19 Community Conversations Initiative, also known as 3C. This program holds structured discussions with communities about the impact of the pandemic, including structural racism, provides coping and resiliency skills, and informs residents of available mental health resources. Over 20,000 New Yorkers have joined these conversations so far, with more scheduled. Helping people disproportionately impacted, including women, learn skills to cope with the mental health effects of the pandemic. For several of these programs, our data show that while these programs are available to everyone, they're mostly utilized by women. Furthermore, we contract with a network of specialized early childhood mental health clinics that provide family-based trauma-informed treatment and family peer support to young children and their families. We also fund family peer services to support parents, caregivers of children and youth experiencing mental health challenges. Finally, we contract with two training centers that build the capacity of staff who serve families in a variety of settings, including clinics, 
community-based organizations, and peer programs. We also recognize the mental health toll the pandemic has taken on people and caregiving professions, particularly healthcare professionals. The health, department, the health department partnered with Health and Hospitals and the Greater New York Hospital Association to develop the Healing, Education, Resilience, and Opportunity Program for New York's frontline workers, also known as HERO NY. This training addresses the mental health and wellness needs of frontline healthcare workers as they respond to the COVID-19 and is used in healthcare and first responder settings across the city. I'd also like to take a moment to note that the health department's work to support the health of women who are caregivers extends to many parts of our agency. For example, the Nurse Family Partnership Program provides support for low-income first-time mothers by pairing them with specially trained nurses who provide information and guidance throughout the pregnancy and until the child's second birthday. Mothers also receive a mental health screening. In our neighborhood health action centers, every member of a family that visits the family wellness suites can access services, health education, and be linked to cross-sector care. Their baby cafes also provide ongoing breastfeeding education, lactation care, and intervention, along with a place for parents of young children to, actual, to access social support and receive re, um, referrals for a wide range of social and health needs. Throughout the pandemic and well before and after COVID-19, the health department has remained committed to protecting the physical and mental health of mothers and caregivers citywide. I thank the committees on mental health, disabilities and addiction and women and gender equity for your ongoing partnership and support as we continue to address the mental health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and care for the health of New Yorkers. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chairs Diaz and Lewis, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Diaz? I'm going to turn it over to Chair Lewis. I'm in desperate need to hear feedback from the Department of Health and they were truly able to engage individuals and I'm eager to learn of the outcomes and, and that's okay, Chair Lewis, with you. It's fine. Thank you Thank so much. You. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Cunningham and Commissioner Ebanks for joining us today. And uh, Commissioner Ebanks, I want to thank you for the recommendations that you shared during your testimony. Um, and I also want partnership with you and possibly Dr. Cunningham because your assistance is really needed. In your recommendations, you mentioned um, localizing services, and myself and some of my colleagues who are on the Zoom today. Um, have pushed and advocated for the Brother Star Sister Star initiative, um, and we're looking for assistance from the administration. We advocated for this because we want to prioritize services locally for communities that were highly impacted by COVID-19. So we hope we can get your assistance uh, with the administration. But I'm going to jump into the first question. Um, and while we always ask these questions um, during the mental health hearings, um, I'm hoping we can have a deeper dive, we can do a deeper dive and have a meaningful conversation about NYC Well and its effectiveness and the intricacies um, of this program. I wanted to know if you could share with us approximately how many New Yorkers use NYC Well. If I could uh, uh, start, uh, Chair Lewis. I want to acknowledge your invitation for collaboration and uh, please rest assured that uh, throughout the administration, I think one of our key values is collaboration in order to create deep impact and lasting impact. And so we are there with you um, on that matter. I also wanna talk about the value of data to this administration as a guiding uh, force in the way we do our work. I think both Dr. Cunningham and I today uh, mentioned how we have relied on data, both qualitative and quantitative, and that data relies on um, partnership with community. 
that it's not merely the fact of pulling information from whatever research mechanisms we have, but it's about going to community, engaging community authentically, and then responding to community based on their input. And we continue to fine tune and improve our programs because we have ongoing conversations with community um, and hopefully can be as responsive as we ought to be to needs and uh, to the multiplicity of needs and the multiplicity of populations we serve. And so with that, I would want to turn this to uh, my colleague, Dr. Cunningham, as she can provide additional information. Thank you very much. Um, we at the health department are absolutely committed to addressing the mental health needs of all New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic and especially women and caregivers. Um, NYC Well, has met unprecedented demand for counseling and emotional support um, and really provides information and referrals um, to ongoing mental health and substance use services since the um, onset of the pandemic. Services are available 24 hours, seven days a week uh, through phone, text, and chats in over 200 languages. Um, during this unprecedented, unprecedented demand, we have seen more than 1.7 million incoming calls, texts, and chats. That's, of the, uh, that's, uh, that's as of uh, September 30th of 2021. Average weekly contacts have increased from um, 5,200 in 2019 to over 6,300 in 2020. Um, in addition, uh, staffing has also increased to accommodate this really unprecedented increase in the calls, texts, and chats. Thank you for that, Dr. Cunningham. Is there any information broken down by gender, race, ethnicity, and zip code? Um, Thank you, Chair Lewis. That's an important question. And we absolutely use our data to target our services and the geography of the services um, that we provide. Um, because NYC Well does not require people to provide information, some of that information is, uh, is missing, is not, is not collected. However, of the information that we do have, uh, the majority of contacts are from women. And earlier in your testimony, you mentioned 64% uh, respondents were female. Were you talking about NYC well? No, um, in my testimony, correct. Okay. I think that's, yes. No, that was the generic, the survey that we released via the web, uh, hence it was non-random. And um, it, it was off the 1,300. We actually got 1,366 responses and 64% of those were women. So the vast majority of the folks who responded to the survey that CGE disseminated uh, were women. Do we know how many women utilize NYC uh, well compared to men? Do we have those stats? Um, what we do know is um, that w uh, among individual, among those who we have data, among the individuals who contacted NYC Well on behalf of someone else, 75% identified as, as female. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in addition, among, um, among those, who, again, who gave uh, information, those who contacted NYC Well on their own behalf, 60% were female. So clearly the majority are female. Got it. And what does follow-up care look like for indo individuals that call NYC? Well, we know it's a referral service, but what does that look like? Can you break that down for us, Dr. Cunningham? What I would say um, is that it's, it's very variable depending on the needs of the individual calling NYC well. Um, so there is follow-up that is available, follow-up emails, follow-up phone calls, um, but it really, you know, NYC well is, is really identifying what the needs are for individuals and then providing the appropriate resources afterwards, some of which does not require follow-up, but follow-up is available. And how does that compare to pre-pandemic pre utilization? Because NYC Well has been around for some time. So what's the comparison between the two? 
Um, the, the use of N NYC Well during the COVID pandemic has been unprecedented in terms of the increase in the volume. Um, just as an example, in 2019, we know that NYC Well averaged approximately 5,200 contacts per week. During the pandemic in 2020, the average increased to 6,300 uh, contacts per week. Got it. And I just want to jump into to something new really quickly, because um, it was mentioned, I don't remember which one of your testimonies regarding the, the newborn home visiting program that was launched in February, 2020. I'm not sure who mentioned it, but I just wanted to ask some quick questions about it because it was launched in February, 2020, and there was a $43 million commitment to this program. And then the pandemic kind of halted the program. Then it was restored on a virtual level. So I just wanted to know if either um, of you can give us an update on this program. I'll let Dr. Cunningham go, as, as I do know, um, you know, and I think you point to a very important shift that pre-pandemic, you know, there was this hope and aspiration of deepening investment in areas of need. And we had always, always talked about the vulnerability of Black and Latinx women and um, maternal uh, pregnancy and birth. And so this program was clearly decided, developed as one intervention went after birth. But the other thing I think we had to realize is how quickly we had to shift as a city and how quickly resources had to be shifted to really address the pandemic. And so the pattern you describe reflects that the, the pandemic sort of, and I think appropriately, of course, you know, subsumed all the, the broader visions and hoped we had for uh, work. Uh, you know, moving forward, had things proceeded as as normal. Thank so I you, let Dr. Cunningham. Provide. Thank you, Commissioner Banks. And one reason why I'm also mentioning um, why we're doing this quick switch is because NYC. Well, not everybody utilizes it, but we know of programs like the new the the new birth program. But also, there are women in our city who are black and brown, as you alluded to, who didn't even have an opportunity to utilize. Um, this service, like Denise um, Williams, who passed away, um, Amber, so many different women passed away and didn't have access to these programs. So I just wanted to make sure that we do the quick switch and take a deeper dive. So I wanted to know, um, Dr. Cunningham, can you please give us an update on the program if you have it? Um, yes. So the health department is absolutely committed to providing support um, to new mothers um, children and really to prevent crises from occurring. Uh, we have the newborn home visiting program along with the nurse family partnership home visiting program. In addition, um, we have the new family home visiting program that's being launched this fall, which will expand service capacity and increase access to care for first time birthing families. Um, the expanded focus will be on first time parents and the 33 tree neighborhoods those who have ACS involvement and NYCHA residents. And you mentioned that it's gonna be launched this fall. Can you, can you share with us, when did the halt stop during the pandemic? Um, the scope changed too. So I wanted to know if you could share a little bit about that. And is this being launched in Brooklyn like it was initially gonna be launched in February, 2020? Um, so we, this is going to be expanded in the th 33 tree neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, again, and in, in addition to those with uh, ACS involvement and NYCHA residents as well for, in terms of expanded eligibility. Got it. So thank you for that. I just wanted to make sure um, we got that covered, so thank you for that. I am going to turn it over now to Chair Diaz. I'm not sure she has any questions. Yeah, I definitely have questions, thank you. I, well, I appreciate the fact that we have 75% of women that have used the services. I'd like to know what are we doing to target the rest of our communities, men, youth, and the LGBTQ community. I, I didn't hear numbers, I didn't hear stats. Who can answer to that for me? 
I would just uh, start by saying, you know, when we design services in, in New York City and, and this administration, mm -hmm. we look at it from, as you know, Chair, the intersectional lens. And so it's a service to all New Yorkers, regardless of gender identity, gender expression, or uh, background. And that certainly includes sexual orientation, it inclu includes age, et cetera. And so sometimes, I, I, you know, if we can provide deeper data, it may not be readily available, but um, we, we focused on providing data specific to women at this point, some of whom, of course, may be lesbians as well. So that intersection is, is at play in, in that data. Um, but um, I don't know if, if Executive Deputy Commissioner has um, additional data information she could provide at this time, but we are more than willing and able to capture that data and report it to you um, at a later date, if that's okay with you. That is okay. Um, as we know, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really brought unprecedented loss of life and distress and social isolation to all uh, New Yorkers. And we know that that burden is not felt equally. Um, and we are committed to addressing the needs of those most impacted by this pandemic. We have a variety of ways in which we've done that in the health department. Um, so this includes sharing messages and resources um, to New Yorkers that um, make them aware of um, reactions that are normal, including grief, and then building upon their strengths to foster resiliency. Um, we promote the use of NYC Well, in addition to um, Project Hope, um, for mental health and substance use support, counseling, and referrals. Um, we also support contracted providers and organizations um, by providing technical assistance on how to best serve their clients. We also partner with community-based organizations, faith groups, and other organizations um, to deliver information about the impact of COVID on mental health, how to access behavioral health resources, um, and building coping skills and community resilience. Thank you for your answer, Brent. and I'd have to just go back to, to numbers. I'm interested in knowing how do, you, how do you collect your data? If I understood correctly, one can call actual services that doesn't have to identify where they live. How do we know that East New York, um, families in East New York are not calling and not outreaching, that we have higher numbers in the Bronx or particularly in Inwood? How, how do you break it down so we know the services are actually reaching those that most in need if you don't track based on call volume? Thank you, Chair Diaz. We, we in the health department absolutely believe in the importance of collecting data and then developing programs to address uh, what we see in the data to target those who are most impacted by COVID-19. We use a, a wide array of data to do this. Some of this includes our public health surveys, which track the trends and prevalence of behavioral health outcomes and experiences, we also track emergency department visits from hospitals and psychiatric wards. We use data from the Office of the Medical Examiners to, to track suicide and overdose. Um, we also use programmatic data from contracted providers and surveys of health providers. So these are just some examples of the wide array of data that we collect to use to target our programs and services. Okay. My next question is concerning the LGBTQ programs. I am interested in knowing um, the success rate in, in engaging clients. Can you give me specific examples other than what you have said? Do you, what, what does the outreach team look like? If we know that individuals are not coming forward, but we know there's likely to be a need in, in the said community, I'd, I'd like to know if the Department of Health is thinking outside the box and how to engage people based on our reports. This Dr. Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. Um, we in the health department are very committed to ensuring that the programs that we offer are culturally competent and sensitive, and we do this in a variety of ways. 
Um, in terms of uh, language, um, for example, uh, NYC Well is available in over 200 languages by phone. In addition, our um, COVID-19 community conversations are available in English, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Arabic, Haitian Creole, and more. All of our materials and guidance documents are translated in up to 13 languages. Um, we also then uh, really center the voices of peers as well. We have many programs in which peers are critical, part of the response and services. And we co contract with community-based organizations located in the exact communities that need services the most. Okay. So let's say I, Dharma Diaz, went to Woodhull Hospital and did not connect with my counselor, I felt the individual was disrespectful. How, how does Dharma Diaz report and in a way that the, the counselor doesn't know specifically that I was made to feel uncomfortable? What's, what's the process? So in, in the health department, we, we have a, you know, a wide uh, array of data collection tools um, that we use regularly. Um, so, so um, you know, uh, I think some of these really include surveys um, that can get at some of this information as well. Um, in addition, having resources like NYC Well is, is, a, is an opportunity for people to be able to call and contact um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in order to get the services that they feel if they, if they haven't been able to get it in one way, can then uh, get those services in another. In, in your literature, is there a conversation that leads to that? If you're, not, if you're not happy with your services, if you have questions or concerns, is, that, is there a 1-800 number in, in someone's mm -hmm. face where it's visible? Again, I'm Dharma. I went to the hospital. I, I'm in dire need of conversation. And I'm just, I, I feel uncomfortable. NYC well will be great, but I think having a visual in front of me where I can call, walk away and call is what I'm asking, do we have that? I know other agencies do have that, that possibility for someone to call. And I just think with the population that we're speaking through today, it has to be in our face per se. If we're in crisis mode, we don't have time to really think and, and go call 311 to try to figure it out. No, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Cunningham, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you. So I, I cannot speak um, to the process at hospitals specifically, um, you know, in a, in a scenario like you described, we would certainly recommend reporting um, this to the hospital, but in terms of, you know, other resources, there, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of outreach efforts that we have in the health department to, to make sure that communities are aware of resources we have a public awareness campaign. Um, we also have several guidance documents that do promote the services that we um, provide. Um, and those include the NYC Well or Project Hope or the um, 3C. So there are a, a, a variety of ways in which we, we do conduct outreach uh, to, to make sure that community members are aware of the services available. Okay. Um, th thank you, um, Executive Director Jacqueline Banks and Commissioner Cunningham. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mr. Dinowitz, for a question, and then I'll resume to my questions. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you uh, for being here. My, my question is quick. I just wanted to follow up on the at-home services you provide. You said from it support people for child, through the child's second birthday. Um, I'm just I'm just curious to know if that support includes guidance through the uh, early intervention process, application process, and follow up. You know, one of the things I've seen is, is the the stress, the mental health stress that having a child with a disability can often have on a family. It is a very complicated system to go through, and it is stressful just having a child who's not um, you know meeting let's say age standards. So. Um, early intervention is a program that helps, you know, alleviate a lot of that stress and is better for the family and, of course, that child. So in that uh, at-home program that supports the families through second birthday, 
does that include the guidance uh, for families through early intervention services? Um, so uh, we at the health department absolutely are committed to, to um, ensuring that uh, children and early in their lives have the, the resources necessary to prevent uh, any sort of mental health crises. And we do this through a variety of programs. So these include the home visiting programs um, and that exist now, which will, and then uh, we're currently launching an expansion of these home visiting programs to expand to the 33 tree neighborhoods, those involved with ACS and um, NYCHA residents. In addition, we have the Early Childhood Mental Health Network, um, and 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 within this network, no, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, I, I I really want to stay in my time. I think you said those things right. I'm just, you know, respect. I I'm just, you know, asking, do those all of those support services include helping families who may be having mental health crises because of children with disabilities that and they don't know they don't know it. Do the services you provide help families navigate a very complicated system of, of, of early intervention and helping children with disabilities? Yeah, I, I appreciate that question. Um, early intervention is one of our programs um, and the experts um, um, are in a different office than mine, but I'm happy to connect uh, you know, them with you after this hearing. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. That was really my only question. I'll leave it with a comment that if, if you know, I, I, for 14 years as a teacher, I, I can tell you the parents of students with disabilities um, have a lot, you know, overall a lot more, let's say mental health needs. It's a lot, it's very stressful for a family of children with disabilities, especially, if, especially for single uh, mothers. It, it's hard enough having children and then having a child who's not meeting great standards or, or there's something and you don't know what it is. So I would um, highly, and, and of course, again, for the, for the child, seeing all of your peers, you know, doing the reading, doing the homework, fine. It takes you three times as long as you don't understand why you're struggling in school, that it, it, the impact on a child is, is devastating. So I, you know, if you don't uh, provide that service, I, I would hope that going forward, um, that in your, in your home visits and in that support that you, incredible support sounds like you're providing for new, new parents, new moms, that you include helping these parents navigate early intervention, which is a component I think of, of, of um, you, you know, helping families and helping children, helping moms uh, with, with mental health crisis. And I would, yes, if you can connect me with those other um, if, with agencies or commissioners, I would val I would value that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a, you have a second question, um, Dinowitz? I haven't been a PTA. Oops. I didn't need it. Thank you, Chair Diaz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I uh, wanted to check to see if any other council members had any questions for this panel. You may use the raise hand function in Zoom now. Seeing no other council members with questions, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Chair Diaz. Thank you. Again, th thank you, Dr. Cunningham for answering the tough questions, Executive Banks, I, I know we, we've been tough on you this morning, but I, I thank you for the quick responses and what sounds to be your creativity during the COVID pandemic. I, I know it hasn't been easy on, on any of us. I'd like to ask two more questions. My first question is in, according to volunteerism through, through this process mm -hmm. and, and having limited resources. I know New York City you know, has been short staffed. My understanding is there's a Press release, Sisters Thrive is a woman-led, family-centered volunteer effort to promote mental health literacy, literacy in Black communities. Does the program still exist? Are they working with you? The, at, at this time, you know, I would have to defer to um, um, the, I, as you know, the program started as a part of Thrive NYC. And so we, 
And um, as Chair Lewis alluded to at, at the beginning, mm -hmm. that uh, there are efforts underway to explore restoring those programs. We want to be able to work collaboratively with you because those programs, as you've pointed out, really serve a particular population and have unique connections in Black and Latinx communities. And, the, and those are extremely high need communities as we've all dictate, uh, stated. So the goal is to identify ways in which to continue to make mental health resources available to Black and Latinx communities. And, um, and so uh, let me just say that we would want to work with you all in making that a reality as quickly as possible. But at this time, I would, and we would have to go to the, the unit that will be charged with working with this. And, and I think to the best of my knowledge, that's yet to be identified. But we do, it sounds as if we don't have a time frame as to when we would like to get back in motion. I, I can't speak to that, no. I cannot speak to that right now. Okay. We've had a lot of conversation in reference about Biden administration, gender, the gender policy, and the so-called agenda for women. Can you describe any efforts in collaboration with the Biden administration? You know, we are days? happy. We are happy to see the administration um, actually naming their work gender equity. That was a big uh, win, I think, for community in general. Um, so we're really happy to see their agenda and are supportive of that agenda. Our work, as you know, from our strategic plan has really focused on several of the areas that they identify, issues of economic strength uh, for women in, and educational well-being, and also um, health, uh, reproductive rights, and sexual harassment and prevention of sexual harassment and, and sexual assault and increasing safety for women and protecting women against uh, gender-based violence and LGBTQ individuals. Uh, we, as a part of our work, have not yet engaged with the, 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 the agenda, but always look forward to partnering at all levels with um, of government whenever collaboration opportunities arise. So we anticipate with this administration that we will have many more opportunities for collaboration than we had with the prior um, administration, federal government. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge Councilman Brad Lander, Councilwoman Cumbo, and I thought I saw Council Borelli. Good morning and thank you for, for joining us. I'm hoping that all three of you are working on, on your questions. This is definitely our, a good time to deal with everyday issues that are impacting New Yorkers. In reference to, to volunteers, um, what's, what's the process? Is there, there's an intake process? Is there training? Do we cap the hours that they're, they're allowed to train? Do we offer them debriefing and also mental health time to assure that they're able to gauge and not take on the, the burdens of the individuals that they're trying to be supportive to? Dr. Cunningham. Dr. Cunningham, can you please ask a um, question for me? I can. She's muted. Oh. Okay. Can you, you can hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. So the health department works closely with community-based organizations, um, providing support and technical assistance, and it would be through this mechanism in which volunteers and peers um, are are involved. So. Um, we do provide that support um, and the technical assistance and um, are available you know, um, for an as needed basis, but it's really through the support of the community-based organizations that, um, that the volunteers would really come into play. I'm interested in learning that we do have a system in place for our volunteers that again, um, 
I wouldn't want a volunteer to be overburdened with their caseloads. And they now they themselves walk away with having mental health needs because they're going mm -hmm. beyond their own school. Yes, you know, we totally appreciate that. And thank you for that, Chair Diaz. We will work with our colleagues to be able to determine the support that, you know, is provided to volunteers through our community network. And I think that's the critical piece here that we're finding volunteers in community to help people in place. And, and um, that's the strength of it. But also, as you're pointing out, that that makes for increased vulnerability for our volunteers. Um, but we need to document for you the supports that we provide to the volunteers as they support others. And so we, we'll make that available in follow-up, if that's OK. Thank you very much. Do you have an night? Um, I'm going to go back to Executive Director Commissioner Banks. Would you be able to tell me, at the top of your head, a number of volunteer organizations that you have working with your projects at any given time? Ooh. N no, I, I could not. I mean, no, I, I really couldn't off the top of our heads in terms of volunteers. But I, I think, as you know, New York City depends heavily on nonprofit partners to mm -hmm. make our engine work, right? And so that's a massive network of nonprofit um, team members. And then we also have our central um, NYC service too that coordinates volunteer activities. So I do think it's it's significant um, just simply being aware of the, the breadth of our nonprofit network and then also of uh, NYC service. So again, we will get those numbers for you but um, it, I do think it has to be pretty extensive. In, in reference to services, can you break it down to me to borrow, um, borrow needs in the sense you feel you get more engagement from Brooklyn as opposed to the Bronx, Queens to Brooklyn? We'll try to get that for you as well. we'll we will. I'm done with my questions for the moment. Chloe? Chair Lewis, do you have any additional questions for this panel? I do, thank you so much, Chloe. Um, earlier this week, the Women's Caucus joined public advocate Williams for a presser on disparities with Black maternal health in New York City um, and just the overall healthcare system in New York City. And we thought about women like Denise Williams, Amber Isaac, Shaeja Washington, and countless other women who were deprived of the opportunity to celebrate childbirth or motherhood. And I wanted to know, how is the city working to ensure that women who are pregnant or who recently gave birth or may have had a miscarriage or any other birth related issue um, are not discriminated against? As you know, we have fought aggressively as a city to support women and pregnant people throughout pregnancy, throughout birth. Dr. Cunningham has identified several programs that have been deployed. In addition, we have been looking um, and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has led on reviewing maternal um, mortality and morbidity cases through um, the, I won't say the name because I, I don't remember the name of the group, but the, the 3M review com committee um, and who are about to give their a report this year in, in sometime in October. So we are on the ground with it. We are increasing partnership opportunities on the ground. And we're certainly grateful for advocates as they continue to push us to do better in this area. Um, it is our commitment and it is a priority for the Commission on Gender Equity that we have greater health outcomes and positive health outcomes for Black and Latinx women around childcare and child rearing. And so Dr. Cunningham, I'll turn to her um, for any more information. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, we, we in the health department are um, absolutely committed to serving those who um, uh, really have the highest risk of having um, poor outcomes and to um, understanding that through the use of data and targeting our programs accordingly. Um, so we do have extensive work on maternal um, morbidity and mortality. Um, and I you know, certainly am happy to connect you to my colleagues who lead this work. Okay, is there any new, besides the new birth program, your colleagues would be able to provide us with more information to ensure that black and brown women in New York City will not be discriminated against during? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Thank you. I look forward to getting that information. Um, and both of you spoke about health outcomes. I wanted to know if you could share some more about NYC Care. Um, does NYC Care cover mental health services? And if so, to what extent can New Yorkers utilize NYC Care for mental health services? Can they go to any provider in New York City? Um, could someone like Denise Williams, um, if she were still here, or any of these young women that we lost in New York City, would they have been able to utilize NYC care with any provider for mental health services or postpartum depression? Um, hmm. NYC care is, unfortunately, I, I am unfamiliar with that. Um, Dr. Cunningham, did you? Yes, I mean, we believe that it's um, absolutely important to make sure that people are aware of NYC care and the other supports that, that we provide. And for this reason, for example, we have provided uh, materials to thousands of people at the vaccination sites using mental health amplifiers to make sure that the public is aware of NYC care. Um, I don't have the exact uh, information about which um, uh, providers that, um, you know, um, that can take the NYC CARES um, program. Um, we don't have h and &H here with me today, but we can certainly get back uh, um, to you, Chair Lewis, on that. Um, so we would appreciate that um, information. I know what the council um, is doing for this, but I, I wonder what uh, your agencies in the city is doing as a whole um, regarding this. Because I, I think as you both have shared, advocates have spoke up and have been loud and clear that these services um, need to be provided. And I know you don't have this information right now, and I know no one from H&H &H, um, is with you right now on the panel, but if you can please just share with us whatever information you do have, how is the city covering issues related to postpartum depression through DOHMH, um, the mental health toll of losing a child or mental health issues related to birth is a serious matter. So I wanted to know how is DOHMH um, covering these issues with postpartum depression? Um, yes, thank you. I mean, we do, you know, we do have our home visiting programs that do provide support um, and do screen uh, women for depression and anxiety um, sort of during the uh, pregnancy and then also postpartum as well. And so, and it's through this expansion of these programs in, the, in tree neighborhoods with those involved with ACS and NYCHA residents um, that we're, we're gonna be able to expand that as well. So both for prenatal and for postpartum care. Do you have the name of any of those programs? I know you mentioned something earlier. I don't know if it's the same thing. Do you have a name of the program? The new program being launched is the new family home visiting program. Any pro program that would provide this service or is there a, a, like a myriad of programs or? So that is the, the program that is being expanded and newly launched this fall. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the existing programs, the newborn home visiting program and the nurse family uh, partnership home visiting program. Okay. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit from um, childbirth to essential workers. Um, our essential workers and frontline workers, particularly women of color, have been overburdened to help the city navigate through the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to know 
uh, and some of them have experienced some traumatic instances and, and, and have seen some things um, that need to be addressed and they may not know that they need mental health services. So I wanted to know, did the city assess frontline and essential workers uh, following the height of the pandemic and what kind of support are they getting? Thank you. The, the, the health department is um, absolutely committed to providing the support needed for frontline workers. One example um, of, of the kinds of services that we provide is um, Project HOPE, which is a crisis counseling and training program. And so this program offers emotional support um, and connects people to um, counseling and it's uh, targeted for those neighborhoods that are hardest hit uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, you mentioned Project Hope earlier, but I wonder if I was an essential worker, I, I was having um, some issues, how do I get access to Project Hope? Maybe my, maybe my employer doesn't know about it. How, how are you sharing that information with employers? So there's a variety of ways in which we are um, really uh, ensuring that, that the public knows about all of the service that we provided, including NYC Well and Project Hope and others. And these include a um, uh, public awareness uh, campaign through social media, through advertisements um, and through uh, materials. These have been expanded during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we uh, also do outreach to community-based organizations and to other providers as well to ensure that they are aware of uh, these programs and services provided. So the public awareness campaigns for the COVID-19 vaccine is excellent. I see Dr. Easterling, Commissioner Shosky, all, all the time on TV. And, but public awareness for mental health services is not really engaging. And I would say if, if there is anything out there, I haven't seen it. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've seen anything that's been really effective. So I wonder what does a real public awareness campaign look like? Um, we know NYC well, because we, we hear about it on the radio, we see it on TV, but what else, what other a component to the public awareness campaign can you make a bit more appealing so folks could get access to it? Because you mentioned NYC Well, you mentioned that you have these services, but if you're an employer, um, you're probably not thinking about this because you're trying to get to the next day, it's a pandemic, and you probably not even worried about your, your workers and how they're feeling and if they're mentally um, stable. So what else can be done through the public awareness campaigns to ensure employers have access to it as well as the workers? Thank you. So in, a, you know, in addition to the public awareness campaign, we also have guidance documents which promote you know, coping, grief, loss, anxiety. Um, in addition, we've also done work at the vaccination sites where we have mental health amplifiers, also you know, informing individuals uh, the, you know, community members about the programs that exist and providing materials there. Um, but thank you, Chair Lewis. We think this is very important um, in terms of addressing, you know, employees and employers. And um, we look forward to, you know, uh, taking suggestions and, um, you know, trying to improve our outreach efforts. And I just want to share with you, Dr. Cunningham, I purposely um, randomly go to vaccination sites um, in East New York and East Flatbush and Cypress Hills. I've even been to a hospital that I won't mention right now. And I'll just let you know, um, they'll just have a piece of paper on the wall or they'll have a brochure um, about mental health services. There's no one physically there asking folks if they're okay and if they need to chat with someone. So I think that's something that needs to be implemented some type of navigator throughout the day. You guys have the money. Um, they need to be in the local clinics and the local hospitals supporting folks being able to utilize indicators when they see folks come in or sitting and waiting to be served. So I hope um, we can utilize something like that to support folks. Um, I, the next question I have is regarding like um, the, uh, the isolation hotel program. Um, so from childcare to elder care, 
Um, women, we all know, are caregivers, they're breadwinners, uh, facing many challenges during the pandemic. And if there are women that contracted COVID-19, how were they supported or how are they being supported um, if they utilize the isolation hotel program to cover those needs? Um, is, is this something, well, let me say that from, from our vantage point, we, we don't have the details, but you can certainly recognize that we had multiple, we've created multiple interventions to address myriad permutations, if you will, of caregiving and of uh, people contracting the disease. So what, what I would say is that we're going to go back to get some more detail on this and how it specifically addresses women who are caregivers who contract the disease, which, which creates a ripple effect, right? Because it's not just a woman, but it's also how do you take care of the family that she has been primary responsibly for. So uh, please let, give us some time to get that information back to you and we'll, we'll bring it back as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you. That'll be helpful. Um, and earlier in either of your testimonies, I can't remember Excuse which- Excuse me, um, Chair. I'd like to answer to that as someone that, I, as someone that isolated for 10 days, I received no mental health services. And on my eighth day, I would have appreciated to have received a phone call to say, how are you? Are you okay? That was not something, again, that was offered to me. And in reflection, I being isolated, thank goodness for technology, but it was a sad and lonely time. If I had mm -hmm. not been a strong woman, a person that was focused, I'm sure it would it would have been a mess, a mental mess for me. But just know, Chair Lewis, thank you for bringing up that conversation because it did take me to somewhat of a dark place, and we need to make a bigger effort. I didn't receive thank a phone call. I didn't receive a pamphlet. The staff, while they were amazing were interested in knowing about my vitals, but not at one time that anyone asked mentally, how was I? And having come in to the, really into the council, having been a frontline worker, I would have definitely appreciated just someone saying, are you, are you okay? Are you having a good day? So Chair Lewis, sorry for interrupting, but for the record, we need to do better. And thank you, Chair. We were isolating individuals. No, thank you for sharing that because I, I remember a constituent um, had to go to an isolation hotel and the constituent didn't have family. They did not receive any support regarding mental health. And I had to consistently pick up my phone uh, during the duration of the time that the constituent was there because they were separated from their community. So I'm, 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 I'm grateful that you shared um, that. And I hope that. Um, the commissioner and Dr. Cunningham could get us some more information. Um, and this will be my last question. Um, this is regarding COVID's uh, impact on mental health. Um, it was mentioned earlier in either of your testimonies, the C3 program and the community conversations. I wanted to know, has the city amended any other programs to respond to the mental health impact of COVID-19? Um, yes, uh, so um, we at the health department have expanded our services during the COVID-19 pandemic to address um, the increased needs in mental health. Um, so some of this includes um, public awareness campaigns to, uh, to normalize feelings of um, grief, uh, to you know, provide um, information about resources to address stress, um, and coping. We've also developed guidance documents, again, to you know, address coping, resilience, and emotional well-being. Um, we have, in addition to the 3C, um, we have new, the Project HOPE, which is specifically uh, crisis counseling around COVID-19 to provide emotional support to individuals. And then we've also have HERO NY, um, which is a program that was developed to support front um, first responders and healthcare workers who are on the front lines of the COVID-19 
uh, pandemic. So those are just some examples of the expanded work that we've done to address the mental health um, issues around COVID-19. And how's the city tracking the mental impact of COVID-19 on women or any other segment of the population through this program? Uh, the health department absolutely believes that data uh, are critical and guide all of the work that we do in terms of our programs. And so we collect data in a, a, uh, several different ways. Some of those include public health surveys that we've conducted um, before and during the pandemic, uh, examining the prevalence of behavioral health experiences and outcomes. We um, receive data from emergency rooms regarding hospitalizations related to mental health. We also receive um, data from the Office of Medical Examiners around suicide and overdose. We also collect programmatic data um, from our contracted providers. We survey health providers as well. So it's really through a, a wide array of um, data collection efforts to really understand the impact of the pandemic. And can you share with us, um, as a representative of DOHMH, I wanted to know if you could share with us, how has COVID been a barrier to providing mental health services in the city? Um, so, you know, we, we, we do collect those data um, about whether people have been able to have access to mental health care. Um, as we, we also work closely with our contracted providers to try and address those barriers. And so for some, some examples of this include providing technical assistance around technology, as we know, uh, you know, we've changed the way which uh, care is delivered during the COVID pandemic. And so providing technical assistance to our programs is one um, component. Another component is providing regular information and updates about COVID-19 to our contracted providers on a regular basis. And then we're also here um, available to, to them as they experience barriers in providing care. Um, for, we're always here for them as a support um, to help troubleshoot those barriers. And what I'm grateful about is that your agency and, and several agencies were able to utilize tech as an opportunity to pivot during the pandemic, um, shifting to a virtual or telehealth platform. Um, do, you, do you know if the city plans to bring back services in person and does the city plan to keep any of the virtual components um, that have been helpful and how are you gonna measure that effectiveness? Um, Sorry, just to clarify, are you um, referring to the are like contracted providers in terms of the um, using technology? It could be the providers. It could be the agency directly. Um, even you have NYC Well, which has the text and chat yes. phone. Um, but then you also had services before the pandemic that were in person. So. For those programs that you've utilized that went vir that were virtual, um, are you going to keep the virtual components? Are you going to go back in person? Are you going to do a hybrid? And how are you going to measure the effectiveness if something that you're utilizing now works um, and you may keep it that way? What is that going to look like moving forward? Um, so, so that's a great question, Chair Lewis. And because we have hundreds of um, contractor providers that we work with, um, we would work with them to see what works best for them and their clients. Um, I also just want to say that a lot of the um, regulations around using um, technology are at a state or a federal level in terms of, um, you know, what, what, what's allowable. But certainly we will advocate to try and improve access to care in every way possible um, for New Yorkers to really access um, behavioral health services. And is there any way to hold um, those organizations um, accountable just to make sure that they're collecting data on how, the, how women are being um, provided these services? And yeah, is there any way to keep them accountable to that, to make sure that we have that information? Um, on a regular basis, we collect programmatic information from our contracted providers. And so that, um, you know, is definitely used to help, um, you know, guide programmatic decisions. 
that's all the questions I have. I'm going to turn it to our moderator, Chloe, to see if there's any council members that have any additional questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Before I turn uh, and ask council members if they have questions, I believe Chair Diaz has additional questions. I, I'd like to go back to, to advertising, advertisement of, of your services. As Chair Lewis eloquently shared with us, there's, there seems to be a disconnect in advertisement of mental health services in comparison to COVID testing and also vaccination. Do you agree that we could, the administration could do better at advertising? I'd like to know if you have an idea what your advertisement budget is. Uh, let, you go. <laughs> Uh, you know, I just want to say that we are always in a position to identify ways that we can do better and we want to do better. Um, anybody who is unaware of the plethora of services we offer, that's a short form for us. And we can't be as impactful as we want to be. So yes, we definitely want to strengthen the way we communicate. We want to ensure that we're communicating about all of our services uh, because there are many. And um, we do have several resources that people should access. So we definitely do want to improve that. So, and as uh, Dr. Cunningham said earlier, you know, we welcome your partnership and your suggestions about how we can and, and should do that, um, to in increase communication. And I would just add to that, um, you know, we, um, we appreciate that feedback and um, absolutely are committed to ensuring that New Yorkers are aware of all the services that we provide and have access to those. Um, we don't have, the, I don't have the budget numbers with me today, but we can get uh, that uh, to you after this hearing. Thank you. I just, I have a testimony. I have an extremely alarming email here. I, I won't go into extreme details, but going back to our first, um, our first responders, according to the email that, that I have received, we have to do a better job. Our first responders are, are in crisis. We have broken homes. Folks are trying to get back to work. So I, what I do know, um, the focus and the gear for today's conversation is, is women, but we should also look to identify who else is in need of mental health services? We should have, I should not be receiving an, an email here from a city employee who, whose marriage fell apart, was looking for mental health resources and no one made available. That, that's it's definitely a, a sad moment to see, you know, I put my head down and, and, and that's what I'm looking at. And with that, it'll, it'll bring me to my, my closing statements. Right? Well, I appreciate the work of the panelists the fact that you worked well on, on getting yourself together and preparing, I think we can admit that we have to do better. It's great to have, to have services available, but if the everyday person doesn't know, then we're failing. I, I suggest that we move forward and learn from other agencies and to see how we can advertise the services that we do have. If it means you have to collaborate, use interagency opportunities then we should begin to do that. This email is really distressful for me to know that we failed a fellow responder. Before we go into public testimonies, I, I like to thank Terry Coxum, my, my alleged director, Sergeant of Arms, my staff who worked on putting this hearing together, Chloe, the committee's senior analyst, thank you for working diligent with me yesterday a late evening and an early morning. I, I thank you for going the extra mile and preparing me for today. Issa White, the finance unit head, thank you very much. And to Brenda, who is not with us, you're missed. And looking forward to seeing the wonderful pictures of your little baby boy, or your twins. Thank you, Chloe, turning it back to you. Thank you, Chair Diaz. We have concluded the administration's testimony and will now turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of the staff will unmute you and you will begin your testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. 
All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Remember, there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Uh, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Uh, now, unfortunately, most of the people we were expecting to testify have logged out. So if I miss anyone when I call the witness present, please use the raise hand function in Zoom so that we can call on you next. For the first panel of public testimony, we will have Dana Hanujdak. I apologize for uh, mispronunciation. Uh, you may begin your testimony once unmuted. Time starts now. Hi, I'm here to talk about um, mental health and what's going on in the community as I work as an organizer for Voices of Women. And I work with so many different ranges of survivors who deal with different issues individually, but it's all kind of the same. You know, when you deal with an abuser who keeps you held hostage in your house, obviously you're going to come out with some scars and bruises. And the number one thing that happens is we get mental illness and we're told we're crazy because we've lived within this abuse. And then we come out and search for help, you know, and it makes it hard if we can't find it, if we don't know what's there, if we don't have childcare, or if we're afraid of losing our kids, or maybe we don't have insurance. You know, a lot of times the stigma goes on and on and on. And I just want to know that we can finally come to a head and help these survivors get away and deal with post-traumatic stress disorder without making women feel crazy for dealing with a person who was supposed to love them for the rest of their life who now says they want to kill them. I just pray that as I continue my work as an organizer, I can bring light to the many of women who are afraid to come forward, who can't call 911 because we live in low, impoverished areas. And if I call 911, the drug dealers are going to be mad at me. So we don't call the cops and bring them to our neighborhood. Although I am Caucasian, I don't consider myself Caucasian. I consider myself a woman who lived in the hood and who now rised up and became an organizer because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone who's continuously working on these issues. Know that there is a correlation to drug abuse because you have to do something to get out of your head. Whether you have mental illness or not, living with an abuser and, and being oppressed you're going to have some type of mental abuse, mental illness because of what you've lived through, because of your survivorship, or because of the neighborhood you live in. You know, I walk down the street and don't just worry about my abuser. I worry about getting hit by a stray bullet. I worry about the cops pulling me over. You know, there's so many correlations to all of this. And it didn't matter that I had fair skin and light eyes. I lived in the hood, so I got... I got uh, stopped by the cops just as much as everyone else. And for me with PTSD, I tend to freak out when I have police contact because my abuser has tried to get me arrested saying I was the provoker, I was the crazy one. So just take all of this into consideration and, and what a woman actually goes through to get out, to Time. get out. Thank you. Ms. Donna, thank you for, for your testimony. As I've shared often, um, I'm a DV survivor. So I, I and as I, I move along, I've made it my business and a priority to extend myself and to figure out a better way to serve anyone that, whether it's drug addiction, domestic violence, you know, or just knowing that there's social biases. You know, I'm, I'm here, um, my ears open, my brain is, is also a sponge. And, and I, th I, I thank you for standing up for the underdog and for you. And I appreciate the fact that you have found the will to advocate for others. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Diaz. Seeing no hands raised in Zoom for additional witnesses to testify, we will turn to closing remarks. Chair Diaz. All right. 
my closing remarks are gonna be plain and simple. New York City leads, we have to make it our business and a first priority as we work on housing equity for, every, for everyone that we also show that mental health is the standards have to be brought up. We've learned here that we have amazing services, but the average New Yorker doesn't know they can call 311 for services. They don't have the 1-800 number. So, um, again, thank you all for participating. Thank you for my colleagues for staying on. Uh, Chair Lewis, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for your hard ask questions. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Diaz. I wanna thank Dana for her testimony, uh, for being vulnerable and for sharing her experience. I too am a domestic violence survivor. Um, and I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through. You'll be in my thoughts and my prayers and we will do our due diligence um, as elected officials to ensure whatever support you need, we're there to provide it. So thank you for making time to share um, what you're going through and, and the needs of your community um, as an advocate. Thank you, Chair Diaz, for partnering on this hearing um, and for having this very important conversation. Um, I don't think it, it happens often. So I wanna thank you so much uh, for spearheading this. And I wanna thank our panelists, Commissioner E. Banks and Dr. Cunningham for making time to talk with us today, but I more so look forward to working with all of you so that we could support women, caregivers, and make sure that we're providing effective programming for um, all New Yorkers in the city and of New York, particularly women and essential workers. So thank you so much. I'll now turn it to uh, the moderator, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Uh, Chair Diaz, you may gavel out. Thank <laughs> you.